You have now arrived at your destination. Sammy, this is such a joy to do. I've heard so many great things from Jeremy, from Sarah, even from your wonderful wife. Uh, I really did my research, clearly. But thank you so much for joining me, Stay Samir. Thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the show, so I'm, I'm honored to be here. That is very, very kind of you. I'm thrilled that you like the show. But I do want to start with a little bit on you. We see Cambly today now becoming more and more public. I'd just love to go back to the beginning. What was the founding moment for you with Cambly? And when was that realization that this was a core pain point that we had to solve? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Cambly grew out of our own experiences learning languages. And so um, my co-founder and I both grew up here in the U.S., uh, and we went through the, the public school system here, took foreign languages as part of that process. Um, and for me personally, I, I studied Spanish, and I never really felt like I was very good at it. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of thought I wasn't really a languages person. Uh, and then independent from that, I, I love to travel. I've been all over the world, and uh, I've been to many places where um, everyone speaks Spanish. And I found that to just be such a better environment for learning a language. And I took one trip to Argentina in particular that um, for a good chunk of it, I was traveling on my own. Um, and I kept finding myself in environments where I was surrounded by people that only spoke uh, Spanish. And it really took like a, a, a situation like that for me to really come out of my shell and, and practice speaking. Um, and what I found is I, I got so much better at the language uh, so much more quickly than I ever did in a classroom environment. Uh, and not just that, it was also just far more rewarding. Uh, oh, the thing I love about travel is getting to meet people and learn about their lives. And I was getting to do that. And so, uh, you know, my co-founder had a really, my co-founder, his name is Kevin. He had a really similar experience um, studying French in school and then going to France. Uh, and we kind of got together on this idea, like, why can't uh, we practice these languages whenever we want? Like, there's plenty of people that, that speak those languages. Uh, they just don't happen to live near us. And so as, as technologists and the product people, we felt like, hey, this sounds like the kind of problem that technology could solve. And what the two of us wanted wasn't necessarily a professional teacher or a formal lesson. Uh, what we wanted was just a friendly person to practice with. Uh, and so that's kind of what we set out to build. Um, and as I mentioned, Kevin wanted to learn French. I wanted to learn Spanish. But as we looked at the market, we, we quickly realized that the world wants to learn English. And so we decided to focus on that. I love that. And I love the focus purely on English. We'll dive into the focus. I do just want to touch on one background element. I always think that we're shaped a lot by our past experiences. And you obviously spent, you know, four years or close to four years at Google. I'm just fascinated. How did seeing the internal mechanics of Google being there for four years, how did that shape your operating mindset and how you are as a leader today with Cambly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I was really fortunate to get a job at Google straight out of college. And so it was my first job. And um, I feel really lucky. I think Google is an, is an exceptional company. I think just getting to see how a, how a really exceptional company was run, I think, was was very formative for me, especially early that early on in my career. Uh, you know, concretely, I learned things like how how you know how to build great software and to do it at scale, uh, which has served me really well. I was on like kind of a metrics and analytics team, and so I learned a lot about metrics and data. I learned a lot about how Google thinks about and approaches data. Um, and uh, I think that helped me understand how to how to make yeah, kind of the importance of uh, data driven decision making, and uh, how, that's something how, that served me super Google, well. How does Google approach data? If you were to summarize it, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. It's a big one. Um, uh, I mean, do, Google has immense amounts of data, and I think they really appreciate this, the scale of data and how sometimes scale of data can win. Uh, and uh, and I think they just rely a lot on data for decision making. Uh, so, you know, you might have an intuition. I might have an intuition. Uh, they might both be totally wrong. And uh, what I, the team I worked on, we ran A-B tests on everything. Uh, and so uh, you just learn a ton from actually putting stuff out there and, and running a split test on it and, and measuring what the impact is. Um, and, and that's something that actually works. It works obviously really well. At a, at a company like Google at, at huge, huge scale. But actually, you can employ a lot of those same strategies at a startup in order to kind of hill climb your way to, to, to a better growth engine. I'm so unfair going off schedule. How do you know when to listen to data and be scientific and rigorous in your approach versus when to go on gut and intuition? Yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I mentioned some of these things apply really well to startups, but uh, the reality is in the very early days of startups, uh, you don't really have much data. And so 
you know, in theory, you might think, oh, let me just like A-B test everything and A-B test my way to success. Uh, and it doesn't really work because like you're tiny, there is no data and you kind of have to like deeply understand the problem and largely go off intuition. Um, uh, as, your, as your company kind of starts to scale, you can then start to layer in these uh, these experiments. Uh, but but it was, I remember in the early days of Cambly thinking, oh man, I, I know of all, all these strategies and tactics and they just don't work at all because we're just too small. Like if you're getting, you know, we ran a we ran a test I think in the really early days where we like cut our prices in half, uh, and I was like, let me try to measure like the price sensitivity of of Cambly, and we were getting like you know a purchase a day or something, and it was like you can't measure anything <laughs> at that point. And so, uh, and so I think I'd have had to sort of tuck away these these techniques I. I knew and understood really well and say, this will serve me at some point down the road, but, but, but not now. That is hilarious. Two purchases in a day. And then you realize one's your wife and you're like, oh, that was not, <laughs> not a successful test. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. I, know, I, I want to start on the fun. We're going to go through the different elements of the business, but you know, bluntly you've got now Basma who did the A, Benchmark who did the B, Jeremy and Sarah, amazing investors. Some of the best you could have got in the world. But it wasn't always smooth sailing in the fundraising markets, I heard. I wanted to ask, like, why do you think in your mind you struggled fundraising in the early days? Yeah, I think, I think a, a, a couple of reasons. Uh, I think one of the really big ones is, uh, well, 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 for starters, Cambly's, a, Cambly's kind of a weird business in a bunch of ways. Uh, and I think one of the ways it's, it's strange is, you know, we were two Americans living in San Francisco uh, building an English education app that was meant for basically everyone who was not here. <laughs> uh, we were building, we were not building the product for ourselves and all of our customers were like everywhere else. And so uh, I think Cambly is inherently a little strange in that regard. And the way that translates to fundraising is you go to talk to an investor and you're solving a problem that they've never really had, but they've never had themselves before. They probably haven't thought about that much. And what's interesting is it, it's this immense problem in the world, but it's not a problem we see every day. Um, you know, there's there's about 7.5, 8 billion people in the world. Uh, 6 billion of them don't know English. And uh, and by the way, of, of those 6 billion, 1.5 billion are actively trying to learn it right now. And so this is an enormous problem, but but you and I, we, we speak English already, and uh, we've always speak, we always, we've always spoken English. And so uh, it's just not a problem we've ever faced in our lives. And not just that, uh, but everyone we know speaks English. It's not a coincidence that the people we talk to and, and our friends speak the same language as us. And so it's this, this enormous problem in the world that, that we just don't see uh, at all. And, and the same is true for investors. And so I think that made it challenging to kind of convince people that, hey, this is a really worthwhile and important problem to solve. So I think that's that's one reason. I think another reason is uh, there have been a, a handful of companies that have tried to tackle language learning before us and, and struggled. And so uh, I think that the net effect, uh, kind of the combo of those to, those two factors, meant that we just had to get we just had to hit bigger milestones than uh, than sort of an equivalent company in order to get that fundraised done. Um, we had to kind of prove 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 more. Can I be so rude and say, when I hear like language learning and ad tech apps in this way, and again, you can hate me for this, but try and <laughs> relay your hate until after the episode. Um, I'm literally like, oh no, like high churn, like the retention is always brutal. It's low ticket prices. It's just like, oh, don't do it. No one's done it. Like, don't do it. Like, just, Samir, I'll give you money to do something else. That's um, ex this is exactly, by the way, why it's hard to fundraise <laughs> because you're not, you're not alone in that feeling. But, but why am I wrong why i'm sorry but and again i'm going off course here every education app has shit retention why is cambly different yeah so uh, yeah retention i think is is yeah one of the maybe the most important metric in a business and so super super important uh to, to look at and pay attention to and make sure you're optimizing for it um i think like if you look at education technology like a lot of the services that exist are either pure software services um, where you can kind of quit <laughs> whenever you want and no one really cares or like a giant classroom, uh, like a, like a, you know, massive online course where also you can quit uh, whenever you want and no one cares. Cambly is quite different from that. Cambly is 
uh, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, not too dissimilar to this one. Uh, and I think because of that, it's inherently just like much more engaging. It's like this human to human connection. Um, and not just that, there's also, you build relationships. You actually like our students get to know our tutors really well. Uh, and, and yeah, there's, there's strong relationships that are built there. And so in the same way you wouldn't like, uh, you know, set up a dinner with your friend and then just sh stand them up. Uh, you kind of feel like you've got some, some obligation to, to, to show up to your, your class in Cambly. And so uh, I think there's, there's a social component and I think it's just far, a lot more fun and engaging to, to, to sort of really exercise the skill of speaking English, uh, by practicing in these one-on-one -on -one conversations. I think that's a big part of why Cambly looks and feels so different from, from your average education uh, technology company. I, I totally get you. Did you ever think of doing negative incentives? I've spent a lot of time studying negative incentives where you actually penalize people for not doing it, which is where you actually start fining them for not showing up. Um, there was a brilliant company that did it years ago for gyms. If you didn't go to the gym, they'd fine you. Um, have you ever looked at negative incentive structures? Uh, I can't say we have, although we've experimented with a few different models where uh, I think one thing that's been pretty helpful is we we kind of built right into our like business model. It kind of teaches you how to use the product. Like you have, um, you know, a, a fixed number of minutes per day uh, and it's use it or lose it. And so uh, I guess you could you could say that's a, a mild negative incentive that yeah. you lose those minutes if you don't uh, if you don't use them. And so well, we, what's really important about learning a language is consistency and daily practice. And so uh, it's kind of baked right into the plan to teach you how to use the product. I totally get you. A final one, and then I promise we'll get back to schedule. Retain, like retention is, is a wonderful like focus and North Star, but it's so much more nuanced than that. How do you define a retained user? What is the action? What is the behavior process that would consider a retained user for you? Yeah, so our, our North Star metric from from like the pretty early days was uh, paid usage. So the, num the amount of minutes that students spend uh, actually using the product. And uh, every minute there is a tutor teaching and a student learning. And so uh, what I love about that metric is it's a, it's a value delivered metric. Um, and that may seem obvious as I describe it to you, but actually I think a lot of the companies that came before us um, optimize much more for revenue. They kind of just focused on the, the revenue number. And the, the challenge with that is uh, you, can, you can sell the dream for a product people don't actually use uh, and, and make a lot of money in the process. Uh, and, and actually a lot of those companies would charge a lot of money up front for it. And it's, uh, it can be really misleading because you might feel like your business is doing really well, but unless you're actually delivering on the value that your customer wanted, uh, you're heading down a really bad path. It's, it's totally unsustainable and eventually will catch up to you. And so, uh, very early on in the first year of us working, we kind of saw that this was a pattern of language learning companies and we've sort of vowed not to become one of those companies. And so, we, um, we, I think one of the best things we did towards that was picking the right North Star metric. Like this is all about usage. Uh, we want people to not just pay for the thing, but actually use it. Uh, and, and as a result of that, I think we've, we've been able to make a number of really good decisions along the way that has, has helped us drive long-term sustainable growth. I'm totally with you. And I think just having the clarity of knowing exactly why it's the North Star and how you measure that retention is, is crucial and one that I don't think enough founders think about. Uh, can I ask you, we mentioned that, like the struggles of fundraising in the early days, but you said actually there is value in tough fundraisers in the early days and having that experience. What do you think the value is of not being able to raise early on, Samir? Yeah, no, totally. Well, don't don't get me wrong. It's painful at, at the time. Uh, but then when you look back and you look at, at kind of where it led you, uh, I think there's there's often some really good things that come from it. And so um, I think, you know, when you don't have a lot of resources, you just have to uh, you have to work with what you have and uh, you learn to be really, really scrappy, really efficient. Uh, and uh, a lot of those decisions you make without a lot of capital, you know, I think in our case, helped us make, helped us build a, a, a product in a marketplace that was just like uh, highly, highly efficient. And then as we scaled it, we were really, really capital efficient in the process. And so, you know, I, I can give actually a, a concrete example. Like we went out to raise our Series A and, um, uh, and it was it was a challenge, like it did not go as planned. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had to basically pull the team together and say, like, hey, 
we were planning on raising an A, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, we're we're going to start executing on plan B. And plan B was actually to get the, the company to cash flow positive. And for sure, it was a stressful time in the company, but we made a number of really good decisions in a very short period of time that, that you know, four months later led to the company getting the cash flow positive. Uh, and, and we've been cash flow positive ever since. And uh, as you can imagine, that has served us super, super well. Uh, it, it, it for, for one thing, made fundraising a lot easier when we went back, uh, when we went back out, you know, uh, a little time later, uh, it just, the conversation was, was very, very different. You're giving me so much to unpack here. Um, f- yeah. first, what was some of the, you said about the decisions you made three or four that really moved the needle. What were those three or four decisions that really moved the needle? Yeah. So, uh, I, one, one nice thing about Cambly is we've, you know, it's a it's a marketplace. It's a two sided marketplace. Students on one side, tutors on the other. We we uh, we very from basically day one we we charge for the product because it was just, it would have just been unsustainable not to. And so um, we had a you know we had a business model that made revenue from day one. Um, there's a lot of leverage in pricing, and I'm sure you've heard this from from other folks before. And so uh, one of the things we did. Uh, in that period was was uh, change our pricing basically and, and and made sure that we you know we had all this money flowing through the system we wanted to make sure we were taking a healthy margin from it and and that could sort of slipped over over time and so uh, pricing was a was a huge one um, uh, we also offer students like a, a number of plans and um, if they want to commit for a longer period of time then they can pay up front for that um, so that has really cash really healthy cash flow uh, dynamics for the business. And so, uh, that was another one. Um, I think throughout our history, we've just kept a really, really lean team. And so, um, we've, yeah, we've done a lot with like a really small team and, and that wasn't necessarily a decision that we, that we made kind of in the moment when we were kind of in that period, trying to figure out how to get the company cash flow positive, but it was a decision that sort of, we continually made in the early days and including like me and my co-founder wearing a lot of different hats and, and serving a lot of different roles for the company. Like we just kind of tried to figure out how we could be as efficient as possible uh, throughout. Well, we're going to talk about you having every role in the company in a, in, a, in a little bit. I do want to ask, um, as a VC, and this sounds ridiculous in 2022, but as a VC today, I'd be going cash flow positive, well, not today, last year, uh, cash flow positive, <laughs> cash flow positive, like you've raised all this money now. And, uh, you know, I spoke to Jeremy, he told me you haven't touched a dollar of your series A or your series B. Like bluntly, you're not optimizing for growth uh, is, is kind of what you one would take away from this. Like, how do you feel about that growth versus profitability now? And now you have the leverage. Is now not the time to spend? Yeah. So I guess one thing I'll call out is uh, just because we haven't touched the Series A money and the Series B money, it doesn't mean that we sort of um, behaved exactly the same, you know, had we not raised that money. Like, Having that cash cushion, I think, allows us to be much, much more aggressive uh, and and make a very different set of decisions. And so um, I think we've benefited a lot from the cash, even if we haven't touched it, because it's allowed us to like plan around that. Uh, not to mention, as you know, Jeremy, Jeremy Levine and Sarah Tavel are, are incredible. Like they've been so instrumental in at helping us figure out how to continue to scale the company, how to recruit the right people into the organization. And so it's not just the money you're getting, you're getting like uh, real expertise. And so I think we've benefited a lot from those raises and I, and I feel really good about it. But, but to come back to your question about, you know, growth versus profitability, um, you know, the way I think about it is I want to grow as fast as, as humanly possible, uh, but I want to do it in a sustainable and healthy way. And uh, I know that the markets kind of change and sometimes that's a trendy thing to say and sometimes it's not. And right now maybe it's a little trendy, but, but you know, we've been doing it for years and years now. And, and I think to, to Jeremy Levine's credit, uh, he's a big believer in that as well, no matter what, you know, which way the tide is going. Uh, and so, you know, I believe you want to build, uh, you want to grow as fast as you can, but do it really, really sustainably. And, and I think one way to think about this is you're not growing like, just to like hit a milestone and then do the next fundraise. Like that's not how I think about it. How I think about it is uh, I want to figure out the mechanisms that will allow me to grow uh, for a very long time. And so if you think about those early days, it's like I'm experimenting, like I'm figuring out what are the things that work. And, and if you're kind of blowing through a lot of cash and doing unsustainable things, there's a really good chance you're learning the wrong lessons uh, and they're not necessarily going to serve you down the road. And so uh, we've always tried to grow in, in a really sustainable way. And I think 
you know, I think if you look at the right time horizon, you look at like, hey, I want to I want to figure out how I'm going to scale this company over the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, we're in this experimentation stage where we're figuring out the things that will allow us to do that. And we're making those investments. And so uh, I think that's like a framing that I think will make you maybe less inclined to sort of burn a hole in your in your cash uh, because you might have the wrong takeaways from that. I'm sure a lot of founders ask you for advice, especially now. Um, how do you advise founders when it comes to capital efficiency, when it comes to fundraising, growth, spend, given your experience and perspective? Yeah, I, I always caveat that with this is my own my own uh, take and my own experience, and you know your your mileage may vary. Uh, I you know I think you, we've talked a little bit about how people were pretty skeptical about. Um, the the space that we're in, and uh, so I kind of caveat it with, "Hey, this is this is my experience." Uh, uh, but but I'm a big fan of of being really lean and being really capital efficient in the early days, and uh, figuring out how to get uh, just really focusing on the core business uh, and making it really strong and healthy and getting that early traction, uh, and kind of plotting a path for you to be able to for the business to be able to stand on its own two feet. Uh, it just gives you so much optionality. Uh, and, you know, again, from my personal experience, when I've not done that, uh, it's been hard. <laughs> uh, and it, was always, it wasn't always hard to predict. It I mean, it wasn't always easy to predict either, right? Like, I thought, hey, the company's doing pretty well. Like, we're a great team. Like, we should be able to, get, we should be able to do this next fundraise. And, and then I've regretted, I think, maybe that uh, unchecked optimism. And so I often try to try to balance out founders who I think, Maybe maybe come in with uh, similar sort of unbridled optimism that hey, here's what some of the realities might look like. This might play out this way. Just like make sure you're not kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. And so uh, that that's kind of often the tone I take when I'm when I'm advising folks uh, specifically around like an upcoming fundraise. I think there's a lot of realizations being made and being realized today that uh, sadly are not the same as last year. So I, I totally agree with you. I think that's good advice. You mentioned like how you think about growth and sustainable growth. I, I think, you know, I want, <laughs> coming from the guy with the fedora, I want to talk about you uh, and the different hats that you wear within the companies. Because whenever I spoke to anyone, they all spoke about your skill here and to di dig in here. And so I wanted to start on performance. How do you define high performance in business today as a leader? I think about performance as uh, sort of focus, uh, you know, results and driving for impact. Uh, and uh, I think like, you know, in the early days, I used to think of that kind of, I think very much at the individual level, like, what are you personally doing to kind of drive an impact in the business? And then obviously as the organization has scaled, I think I've, I've really grown to appreciate um, what, what great leadership looks like and how, and then the type of leverage that has uh, on the business. And so how do you create an organization and an environment that, that drives towards impact? And, uh, and I think one of the things I've been, I've been thinking about even more recently is, you know, we've got a much larger company now, like how do you get, everyone across the company aligned and kind of running in the same direction. Uh, and so uh, my, my performance, my, my definition of high performance, I think has evolved over time, but, but it started off with sort of individually, what are you doing? How, how, how much are you driving for results and impact? Uh, and then it's kind of grown and evolved into uh, how you get your organization or whatever kind of whatever's under your purview, driving, driving in the right direction and, and everyone on your team sort of pushing towards impact. A couple of things that always strike me when you grow a team quickly like you are, how do you retain speed with increasing team size? So often you get bloat, you get processes. How do you think about retaining speed with scale of team? Yeah, it's a, that's a tough one uh, and something I've definitely like has, has been challenging. I don't know if I have a silver bullet uh, for it. I think uh, when you're small, it's really easy to kind of know what everyone is doing. And so you can kind of almost personally uh, make sure that like people are focused on the right things and you can get kind of give feedback in a one-on-one -on -one context. Uh, but as you grow, obviously that, that quickly breaks down. And so I, I think you have to introduce like a bit more, um, you know, process and organization around it. Uh, uh, things like planning, things like setting goals, uh, being really deliberate about who owns what and like, uh, giving giving folks across your org ownership over you know ownership autonomy over um going after certain goals and so 
uh, but but it's a learning process. I think we're still figuring it out, and I think uh, it's yeah, it's something that I think has has been has been challenging, and, and yeah, we're 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 getting better at it every Speaking day. Speaking of learning processes, I always think we learn from as a leader from tough times and mistakes that we've made or tough times we've experienced. Um, when you think back through the Cambly journey, and this is a really hard one to throw on you, so forgive me, but um, I want to ask: when you think back through that journey, what's the hardest? Like, well, what's the most painful experience that you've had that's also been very good for you as a leader to have had and you're pleased to have gone through? Yeah, so I'd have to go back to that same one that I kind of touched on uh, when we went to go out and raise our Series A and uh, it did not go as planned. And so, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Campbell's cash flow positive today and has been for the last five years. Uh, that was not, you know, that did not happen. That was not our choice. We didn't say, hey, today we're going to become cash flow positive. Like we became cash flow positive, be, you know, out of necessity initially. Uh, and so, you know, we we had some amount of money in the bank, we were, but we were burning a decent amount and we went out to raise and it didn't happen. And so we kind of had this moment where we're like, okay, this is, you know, it was the first time, first and only time in our history where we had um, sort of an existential risk. And, uh that's stressful, uh, but it also brings a lot of clarity in terms of what you need to focus on. And uh, what me and my co-founder noticed, I think, uh, you know, as we kind of started executing on Plan B and figuring out how we're gonna how we're gonna uh, plot a path uh, to to cash flow positive for the business, what we noticed is that like the rest of the company was kind of continuing to do the things that they were doing, and they were good things. But they, they, you know, we were, I think, coming in and saying, hey, don't stop doing that. Do this other thing instead. And, and I think what we realized is it probably seemed kind of arbitrary. Like, why are, why are Kevin Smear saying, like, stop doing this and, and work on this instead? And, and what we realized is they were just missing really, really important context. They were trying to grow the business and thinking years out. And we were trying to stay alive. Like, we were trying to keep, <laughs> you know, keep the company from running out of cash. And so when we had this realization, what, what we decided to do, and again, this was, this was very scary at the time. Uh, uh, but I think it was a really, it was a really good growth moment for me, and something I, I learned a ton from is we we decided to pull the whole company together and say, here's what happened. Like we told you we were raising a Series A, it didn't happen. Uh, were, you, here's what, were, you worried, were you worried about them losing faith, losing morale, going, oh God, Cambly's not the rocket ship that I thought it was. I'm going to move. Right, that's a dangerous move. Yeah. Were you worried in that moment, and how yeah. do you think you did it? Yeah, I was I was absolutely worried in that moment, and uh, I think there's a lot of you know it's, it's I think inherently a very scary thing to do, uh, and I can't say that I was like this is definitely the right decision immediately. Like I had to kind of like work through it, but and work up enough courage to do that. Um, but but ultimately, I think we decided like in order for us to figure out how to get out of this this predicament we're in, uh, we need the team to help us. Like there's there's no other way to do it, and so. Uh, I think there was a, a fair amount of trust and faith that like, hey, we've got a we've got a group of people that I think can uh, can will pull through for us. And uh, I, I think what helped was um, we we told them, you know, here's the update, like the fundraise is not happening. Here's what we need to do as a company. Uh, and I think it was helpful that we had a plan. <laughs> uh, we didn't just say, OK, things didn't go according to plan. Any ideas, anybody like we, we came in and we said, here's what our plan is. And not just that, we'd actually started executing on it. Uh, through some of the things I mentioned, some of the price changes, helping our margin, increasing our margin. And so we didn't just have a plan, but then we showed a graph of like, and here's what our gross profit was two months ago. Uh, here's what it looks like today. We're actually on the path. And so I think it was helpful to, I think, uh, show that, hey, here's the way out of it. And we're on that path, but we need all of your help in order to get there. Uh, and I think that level of transparency was was, yeah, like I said, scary, but I think really, really powerful. And and we, we entered that room with a team that was, I think, pretty, you know, misaligned for, for lack of a better term. Like we were just prioritizing different things. Uh, and we left that room with a team that was very highly aligned that like, this is what we have to do as a, as a company. And, and it was incredible. I mean, coming out of that, like everybody across the company started working on all of the most important things to make sure that we could get the company to a to healthy, sustainable, and in our case, cash flow positive place. And and I think that was, again, a very stressful, challenging time for me as a leader, but something I reflect on. I think the company made a ton of progress in those few months. And I think I grew as a leader a lot. And I look back on that and, and draw lessons from that all the time. Were you a remote team then? We were not. No, we were in person. 
would it have been different if you were a remote team do you think uh i think you can you know i, I i'm a fan of, of in-person collaboration uh and so i always bias a little that way uh but but i think you can do this stuff remote as well like you know i think another moment when when we had a i think a similar kind of conversation with the team uh when probably every company across the world was having the, this conversation was when, when the pandemic hit uh, and again, we kind of, I think I, I looked a lot on the conversations we had during that attempted Series A process and, and tried to say, okay, the best thing to do for the company, for the team is to, to like bring everyone in and say, here's what's happening. And so uh, that one, I, we, did, we did over video chat, we did remote, and I think it went over really well as well and uh, got the team aligned, kind of put everyone at ease. Uh, and so I think it's, I think it's doable at a remote, but, but it doesn't hurt if you can all be together in, in a room. No, I, I'm totally with you. I mean, speaking of kind of the team, uh, no one more important than your co-founder. I spoke to Kevin before the show, um, and he said, uh, wonderful, wonderful trait of yours is your ability to learn. Um, he did say there's a downside, which we'll get to later. Uh, <laughs> but um, he said your learning process, like figure out, he's so smart and he learns so many different things so fast. What is your learning process? How do you deconstruct new subject matter? How do you think through how to learn? Yeah, so uh, it's maybe not a secret that I, I like immersive uh, learning. Uh, that's what, what Cambly is all about. Uh, and so I like to really like dive deep into a topic uh, and, and really kind of try to wrap my, my, my head around it. Um, uh, I also like, uh, I'm very much like a first principles kind of thinker. And so uh, it's really important for me to not just um, understand the what, but also the why. Um, like, cause, cause sometimes, you know, those lessons might not apply very directly. And if you don't understand like where stuff is coming from, you might take away the wrong, you know, you might have the wrong takeaway from that. And so, um, that's, that's really, really, really important for me as well. Um, so like for me, for me, when I think about my learning process it's generally, actually, I hate reading. Um, I gain no, no interest in reading. It's boring and it's lonely um, I just talk to the 10 smartest people I can find on the space. Totally. And then I write three bullet points after each call and I find the commonalities between what they said and the ones that are the most important. I then look into more and then I'll actually do some research. That's my yeah. process, which is why I did interviewing VCs, actually. That's why I started the show, because I just wanted to that's learn. Great. Like, that's great. Yeah. That's mine. Do you see what I mean? Do you think of your yeah. process like that? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, so I think another thing that's like, been really valuable and helpful for me is I love like applied learning. And so uh, I love taking knowledge I have and then applying it. I think it's just like much more satisfying and rewarding. And so, and I think I've always felt that way. Like I, I think back to like uh, when I was in high school and I was learning calculus, uh, we, you know, I went home and I like told my, a couple of my friends, Hey, I just learned this new thing. And we were working on building a bike ramp. Uh, and I was like, Hey, let's, I know exactly how to figure out like, what the what the slope uh you know what the slope of the trajectory is on the way out and kind of applied the calculus i just learned like earlier that day to figure out how to build the spike wrap and so it was like just made it way more fun and so i think another another good example of that is uh, i learned accounting in uh in college and i and i felt like this is pretty boring uh and then when i came back to it at cambly and my business really depended on it uh all of a sudden it was like this really, really interesting thing that I was like really deeply like, I got to figure this out. Uh, and so I, I love applied learning. Um, I think the other thing, yeah, the other thing that comes to mind is, is, you know, one-on-one -on -one interactions. I think, you know, when I think about the times when I've learned the fastest, um, they're all like one-on-one -on -one interactions with someone who knows way, way more about the subject matter than me. Um, and I think what's really, really powerful about that is uh, I can, uh, I can kind of, uh, I don't spend any time talking about the things that I already know. Uh, I can kind of stay right on the edge of my learning curve and kind of hang out there. And I think that's that's when you maximize your rate of learning. And so um, I'm a huge, huge fan of that. And, you know, that's what Cambly is all about as well. Uh, it's all one-on-one -on -one interactions with, with someone who's an expert at speaking English in this case. Um, and... I think an interesting, I don't know if you've heard of a study called Bloom's Two Sigma Problem, no. uh, but it's this, re it's this really interesting uh, study that was done decades ago now where uh, basically they compared one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring to a traditional classroom environment. Uh, and what they found is that 
the traditional uh, the the one-on-one tutoring was was far more effective than a classroom environment. And and when I say far more effective, I'll quantify it. The two sigma stands for two standard deviations. So it was two standard deviation standard deviations better. And um, what uh, and it was this like super interesting uh, study, but it was kind of academic because because you know decades ago, like what do you do with that? You're like, okay, this is far better, but like how do we actually bring that to market? And uh, I think what we're doing at Cambly is we're actually taking that and scaling it to a level it's it's never really seen before in the world. Uh, uh, we're we're one of the largest, if not the largest, one-on-one tutoring platforms in the world right now, and so we're running this kind of enormous experiment. Uh, applying that, uh, applying that study, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a highly effective way to learn. I think what's really, pow- yeah, what's really pow- uh, powerful about one on one is it's um, really personalized for for you. Can I ask what was harder to acquire, supply or demand, and has that changed over time? Uh, so we've always been a demand constrained marketplace, so uh, we can grow the marketplace as fast as we can find demand. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are there are billions of people trying to learn English, so there's no shortage of demand at all. It's this enormous problem uh, in the world. Uh, it's purely a matter of how do you reach those people in a uh, in a cost effective way, and uh, and that's yeah, that's been the general bottleneck of our business. Totally get you. How did you acquire the first teachers? So really early on, yeah, we were kind of scrappy across the board. We uh, we posted to job boards and forums uh, and kind of got our initial tutors that way. Uh, and being a tutor in Cambly is actually like a really cool job. You get to uh, talk to interesting people around the world, uh, learn about their lives, uh, and um, you can and you get paid for it and, and you can work like whenever you want. Uh, and so totally flexible hours. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool job. And I think as a result of that, uh, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, word of mouth growth. Uh, and so a lot of our tutors come from just, you know, hearing about it from a friend. Uh, and we've actually have, we've had, I think for most of our company, a long wait list of tutors that are really excited to join. And, uh, we just onboard them kind of in lockstep with the student side of our uh, our student side growth. You mentioned distribution there and just getting to them. I think a lot of distribution is actually consumer resonance and storytelling and kind of product marketing. It was another skill that, that Kevin and Jeremy actually said you were fantastic with. So how do you think about what makes a crew... <laughs> A truly, how do you think about what makes a truly great story and really effective product marketing today? Yeah, so see, I I, I like I like storytelling. I, I find it fun, and I, I think like the way I would dissect that is I think stories uh, about people are just much more interesting than than stories about you know numbers or categories or, or broader things like that. And so, um, you know, I think it's a lot more compelling to hear about like one student on Cambly uh, and their personal journey. It just it draws you in a lot more. Um, uh, I also love to share like small details, I think, that that uh, that kind of makes people resonate and, and understand the story. And so that, that's a personal, you know, stylistic uh, preference of mine. I can give you an example. Like when I'm when I'm talking about Cambly, I often uh, bring up uh, this uh, Turkish pilot who started using Cambly. And and when we heard about him, we're like, oh, that's interesting. Like, why why would you use Cambly as a, a, a you know as a as a pilot? And what we learned as we kind of dug in was, if you're um, yeah if you're a pilot in Turkey and you uh, and you only know Turkish, uh, you can fly anywhere you want in Turkey. But if you want to fly internationally, uh, English is the official language of air traffic control. And so um, if you could just learn English, uh, then you'll get a promotion and you can fly anywhere in the world you want. And so uh, that, you know, it is a very, very clear ROI. There's a very clear demand for one to learn that. And I think as a result of that, this Turkish pilot uh, went on to learn English on Cambly and, and was able to, to fly internationally. And, and we actually have a lot of pilots like that. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's a good example of like the type of student that's on Cambly and why people are using the service. Uh, but what, why I mentioned that here is um, I tell that story when I'm talking about Cambly and you know, weeks, months later, people are still talking about Turkish pilots. And so I think the, the level of detail there and kind of the fact that it's about this, this individual's journey, I think makes it really memorable. And, and I've seen that one, that one resonate with people really well. 
I, I love that. And I, I didn't know that actually in terms of their ability to do that. Um, can I ask you, leadership is ever changing. What gets harder over time, Samir, and what gets easier? In some ways, running the company can get easier because you hire all these people with uh, a ton of experience and uh, they, they, run, they run actually large parts of your org. And so, uh, and, and you can learn from them. And so, uh, you know, as the company is scaled and we've been able to bring on some, some folks like that, we're just, I just don't have to be in the details as much anymore. Like they know far more about their domains than I do. And so you can kind of hand that off and let them, let them run, run the company or, or sort of run, run their piece of the company. Um, so I think that gets easier. Um, uh, a lot of stuff gets harder. I think, you know, the, the, the scale of the problems are just bigger. I mean, you've got uh, a much bigger business, you've got uh, much more customers, you've got uh, a bigger team. And so everything's just a, you know, everything is just higher stakes. Uh, and so I think there, there are a lot of challenges that, that, that come from that. Um, uh, and also culture, I think, uh, you know, is can be, you know, scaling your culture can get challenging. I think when you're really, really early on, you're, you know, you have one-on-one -on -one relationships with everyone at the company and you can influence that very much personally. Uh, but as the organization grows, you have to find ways to kind of, to scale that and uh, bring on new people and kind of bring them into your culture screen for that. Um, and so I think that, that can be challenging as well. What is the first thing to break in a scaling organization? Uh, I think like, the the thing you touched on earlier around like how do you how do you keep uh how do you increase your velocity as you grow the organization i think that's a really challenging one that uh can be can be misleading because uh it feels like if you add people to your company of course you'll go faster but it's not a given that that that, that happens and and i think kevin and i like had been you know in organizations where we saw like teams grow and then not necessarily move faster as a result of it. And so uh, I think that's one that like is particularly top of mind for me. I don't know if it's the first thing that breaks, but I think it's one that, you know, how do you make sure that as you add people, uh, your your company actually moves much faster? Uh, and if it moves slower, that's that's terrible, right? But even if it's moved the same speed, you've now just become a less efficient company. Uh, and so figuring out how you can still drive that same level of impact uh, as the organization grows, I think is, is a real challenge. And I think we're getting much better at it, but it's been, it's been a learning curve for me, for sure. What have been your biggest hiring mistakes? Hiring is always a challenge. What have been the biggest hiring mistakes for you? Yeah, so uh, we have this really interesting country manager model, and I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, but I can, I can zoom into this, this, this uh, question. Um, you know, when we were hiring country managers, and uh, again, Actually, maybe I'll take a minute to like talk about our country manager sure. model. Um, yeah. So we we've um, because of the how how unusual Cambly is as a business, uh, we've uh, we kind of discovered fairly early on that uh, we we need to market to all these places that we don't know about. We don't know the language. We don't know the culture. And so uh, the literally the first hire that Kevin and I made, we were two sort of former Google software engineers. Uh, and employee number one was a Korea country manager. So pretty odd makeup of a three-person team. But when you think about the space we're in uh, and the, you know, the business we're in, uh, where our customers are, it made total sense. And what we found was if you could hire the right person, uh, it was a massive unlock. I mean, Korea went from being kind of not even really on the map to, to quickly becoming our biggest market shortly after making that hire. And so obviously a lot of really interesting lessons there. Um, and um, I guess we did a good job with that first hire. I think over the process, what what we learned is there are certain qualities that that are really really important. And so I think one that comes to mind for your question was uh, you can hire a great like marketer, for example, uh, but if they have any level of success, they have to then start to build out a team. And so uh, you want to make sure that they're they can they can lead as well. They're a manager, and I've made some mistakes there where we've hired some country managers that. Um, either were great individual marketers, but but had more challenges uh, running a larger team. Uh, we've hired some uh, that have 
struggled with some of the analytical pieces, which we find we found to be really, really important in that role. And so that's probably the first thing to come to mind in terms of in terms of hiring mistakes. But hiring is really hard. Like you're going to make mistakes. And I think you just sort of have to be comfortable with that. And and uh, and when you do, you have to correct it as, as quickly as you can. When you look back, what are some of the signs that an individual contributor is able to scale into a leader and a manager? Uh, I mean, I think for starters, like they have to have an interest in it and they have to want to do it. And so um, that's really important. Uh, you know, I think I think you can look for an aptitude and uh, some some sort of core skills as well. Uh, uh, you know, I. I think like the sort of the EQ side of things, like, are they, are they not just really smart, but they actually like understand people really well. I think that's uh, what motivates people, uh, you know, how people approach, approach things, how people think about uh, their careers. Uh, these are all the sorts of things that I look for to like, see if someone is going to become a, a, a good manager. I think self-awareness is also really important. Um, and, and humility is, is one where like, uh, I think being a manager can be a humbling experience. <laughs> and, uh, I think if you, if, you know, I think a lot of us managers come in thinking like, oh, I've already like, you know, led a team before, like I've been a tech lead or, and this is for sure how I thought about it. Like how hard could, could management be? Uh, and then it's a bit of a rude awakening. And I think you have to be really open to that and, and open to learning. And so, uh, I think sort of a combo of humility and, and, uh, interest uh and ability to learn i think are all 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 factors that i look for final one do you have a high tolerance for risk uh in some ways yes and in some ways no i think like uh, i mean personally i love to like you know i'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie and so uh i used to skydive when i was in like college and hang glide and you know love to ski and so I, I take a lot of risks uh you know or you know, you could say our risks in my in my personal life. And I think starting a company like Cambly was, you know, leaving a cushy job at Google and and deciding to kind of get into the startup world was was a pretty big risk in itself as well. Um, but I also like to think things through really carefully. I like to think decisions through. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I don't know. I, a, a mix of an answer is there. I, I, I'm I'm open to risk, but I want to really like understand what I'm what I'm getting into first before I before I take the leap. I, I totally get you. Uh, I, I do want to move into my favorite, though, which is a quick fire round. So you know how this yeah. goes. I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Yeah, let's do it. Given the fact that I hate reading, you can be the intellectual one. What's your favorite book and why? So I'd have to go with a, a book called uh, The Most Human Human by uh, Brian Christian. And uh, Brian's actually a close friend of mine. Uh, and uh, the book uh, sort of follows the journey of, of the author uh, participating in, in something called the Turing Test. Uh, and uh, basically the setup is there's a, a panel of judges and they chat over, uh, over like an, an instant messenger type interface. Uh, what they don't know is whether they're talking to uh, a chatbot, an AI chatbot, or an actual human. Uh, and they have to try to guess and figure it out. And, and they give an award for the... the the, the chatbot that does the best and fools the most people is the most uh, human computer. Uh, and they also give a, this sort of funny award to the human who convinces the most people that they are in fact human, uh, the most human human. And, and it's just a fascinating read. Uh, and it's all about human connection. Um, and as you can imagine, there's lots of parallels to, to Cambly there, which is also uh, all about one-on-one -on -one interactions and, and human connections. So yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. What do you think is your biggest strength and your biggest weakness? If you do 30 seconds on each. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest strength is probably giving people a lot of ownership and autonomy. Like I, I like actually handing things off. And I think, you know, the, the, the country manager org that I talked about is, uh, has done really well. I think a, a big part of that is because I've, uh, I've hand, you know, I, I couldn't do the job. I, I, I handed off and I gave people these, these high level goals and, uh, and said, okay, like go figure it out. And, uh, I think I've done a really good job giving people a lot of ownership and autonomy. And, and I think that's, that's helped kind of build, build a really good, um, sort of leadership dynamic within the team. Um, uh, and I think it allows people kind of the space to do their best work as well. Um, and, I think the weakness is probably like the one I was just touching on. Uh, uh, I like to think things through really carefully, uh, but at a startup, you have to kind of trade that off with with speed as well. Uh, and so 
you know, and you have to make decisions with imperfect information. And so this is one where like, I try to sort of counter that by surrounding myself with the right people. My co-founder for one has a very different style than me. And so we complement each other really well. Uh, and then I also like to talk to lots of people that uh, can help, can help, you know, help me think through a decision. And, and I think it lets me kind of get to a, the right answer faster. What's the hardest element of your role with Cambly today? Uh, I think probably the one of the most challenging things is we've got a, we've got a really global business with a really global team and uh, running uh, this global workforce uh, really effectively and kind of keep everyone connected to 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 the, the sort of the central team I think is has been a challenge uh, and then I think also as we've scaled like scaling our culture we we had kind of a really strong culture uh, with a small team early on and figuring out how do we you know, as we grow the team, as we bring on leaders, how do we preserve aspects of that culture, but also evolve that culture uh, as the business grows? Tell me, if you could be CEO of any other company, what company would you choose and why? Uh, I'd have to go with Airbnb. Uh, I, I think that's a company we've looked up to for a long time. I think it's a, I think it's a really cool company. And uh, there are a lot of interesting parallels to Cambly. It's a uh, it's a it's a cross border marketplace, um, not too dissimilar from Cambly. Uh, it's introducing kind of a new behavior uh, that that people didn't have before. Also, pretty similar to Cambly, and so uh, I, I think it's like it's a really and I, I think it's a really interesting company. It's also about connecting with people in other places, and so uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun to, to 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 run that company if I if I wasn't working on Cambly. What do you know now that you wish you'd known at the start of your founding of Cambly? Um, I think, uh, hi- hiring in like leaders with a, um, with a really like deep expertise, uh, in an area, I think, you know, we, we ran a, a good chunk of the company for a long time without, uh, without hiring, like we were kind of a team of people that were learning on the job. And I think only more recently have we hired some, some very senior folks, uh, you know, we hired, the, the head of finance out of Airbnb experiences. We hired the, the head of core product um, out of Pinterest and, and lots of other great leaders onto the team. And I think uh, that just allows you to move faster uh, because uh, uh, folks like that can draw from, from the many lessons they've had in their, in their very successful careers and, and bring, inject those things into Cambly. Uh, and so uh, I think I, if I could go back, I'd say, hey, uh, pull in, pull in, pull in some, some really strong leaders with a lot of experience earlier and, and you'll be able to get, you know, get to where you're going faster. Penultimate one, what would you most like to change in the world of startups? I think the failure rate uh, is probably the, the, the thing that comes to mind. Uh, there's so many people working on startups and kind of pouring their hearts into it. And uh, the, I wish there was better information and better education about how startups work. Uh, you know, I was really fortunate, you know, my time at Google, uh, I worked at a start, another startup after Google, then I did Y Combinator. Like I had a lot, you know, I got, I had a lot of context that I was able to learn from. Uh, and, uh, a lot of people that are working in companies, uh, and startups don't, don't really have exposure to that. And so, um, I'd love to like, you know, I wish there was broader access and, uh, uh, and, it, and more of a level playing field when it comes to, to starting a company. Final one, 2027, so five years time. <laughs> Where are you and Cambly then? Paint that picture for us. Yeah. So, so our mission as a company is to bring, bring really high quality English to every English learner in the world. And, uh, and, and we, you know, the company scaled a ton, the company's doing incredibly well. Uh, but, but we are very, very far from, from achieving that mission. We've got much, much more ahead of us than behind us. Uh, and, you know, 1.5 billion people trying to learn English. Uh, we've got only a, a very, very tiny fraction of them, those people in Cambly today. And so, uh, you know, a lot of what we're focused on right now, and I think will be for the next five years, is just figuring out how to bring Cambly to more and more of those people. And and there's very concrete things we have to do there. Like, um, Cambly's pretty expensive today. I think we have to find ways to make it more affordable and accessible to, to help more people. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about like matching. I think matching you with the right tutor is really, really powerful. Uh, that Turkish pilot I mentioned earlier, uh, he found a tutor that had aviation experience. And so he could learn not just everyday English, but 
the specific English you needed to, 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 to communicate with air traffic control. And we have lots and lots of examples like that. And so matching you with the right tutor is really important and really, really powerful. And so uh, I, I think we've gotten much, much better at that over the years, um, just with scale. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think, we, I think there's a lot more we can do there uh, to get you kind of not just a friendly native English speaker, but the perfect tutor for you. Um, and then personally, like, uh, I just want to grow and learn to be a, a better leader. And uh, I think we've got some of our most exciting years ahead. Uh, and uh, I think I'll have to work hard in order to, to keep up with the rapid growth of the business. And so uh, I, I, this is why I'm here. I love, I love learning uh, and I love new challenges. And, and I, I love that running a startup like no day is, is, is ever the same. And so uh, I'm pretty excited about all the new things that are coming over the next few years. And uh, and, and trying to trying to keep up and, and scale with the business. So, I mean, listen, I've loved doing this. I, I, I said to you beforehand, I, I had so many different calls and references, and so I felt like I knew intimately well, um, but this has been such a joy. So thank you so much. For-